Tonight, we're going to talk about the American elections. Now, you might be wondering, why do I care about the American elections? Well, the thing is that who wins in these elections is actually going to matter to India more than you think. It's going to matter a lot to America's partners like India, and it's going to matter a lot to the general global order. And we might see a very different America, a very different global order, and a very different relationship with India, depending on who wins this election. So let's talk about it. You may already be aware that current US President, Joe Biden, stepped down and is not running again because, you know, he's not technically alive. <laughs> So he was made to step down by the democratic establishment, but he did not go quietly. So now in the 2024 elections, in one corner, we have the Republican nominee, Donald Trump, one of the most divisive, but also one of the most entertaining politicians on earth. Like you wouldn't have your job if you weren't beautiful. They're worried about my tone. Oh, look at my African-American over here. Look at him. I never attacked him on his look. And believe me, there's plenty of subject matter right there. That I can tell you. You've called women you don't like fat pigs, dogs, slobs, and disgusting animals. Your Twitter account Only is Rosie several... O'Donnell. Oh! And in the other corner, we have Kamala Harris, the Democratic contender, who speaks exclusively in confusing Pinterest quotes. Well, there was a lot that was done, but there's more to do, Anderson. And, and I'm pointing out things that need to be done, that haven't been done, but need to be done. When it comes to the climate crisis, which is why we will work together and continue to work together to tackle these challenges and to work together as we continue to work. I can imagine what can be and be unburdened by what has been, you know? So let's talk about both these candidates and what they would bring to the table, particularly when it comes to America's relationship with India. Let's talk about Kamala Harris. Now, Kamala Harris, or in America, as they say, Kamala Harris, is actually a fantastic example of failing upwards. In 2020, when she was running for president, she did not get a single delegate, and she was one of the first candidates to be eliminated from running to be president. However, despite being one of the first candidates to be eliminated, she was chosen by the eventual winner, Joe Biden, to be his vice president. And now now, because Joe Biden, as I said, is technically not alive, she automatically becomes the presidential candidate. She's got the support of the Democratic establishment as well as Hollywood. She's got Obama endorsing her. She's got endorsements from Taylor Swift, Billie Eilish, Mark Hamill, aka Luke Skywalker, and even Jennifer Lopez. Not just that, she's got Brian Cranston, Chris Rock, Ben Stiller, Tracy Ellis Roth. Not just that, look at the long list of celebrities endorsing Kamala Harris. Her main policies are about reducing the cost of living, which she said has gone up far too much in the previous administration, which is also her administration. So basically, she has promised to solve the problem that she helped create in the first place. Man, she's already a fantastic politician. She's also promised to expand healthcare for all Americans, to provide better governmental assistance to black Americans, lower cost healthcare, more affordable housing, and she's also very vocal about women's rights to choose and her opposition to the abortion ban, for which she has received significant female support in the country. And also the fact that Trump has been accused of sexual misconduct by several women probably also doesn't help his cause with the women demographic. She's also spoken about providing greater protection for undocumented immigrants and creating better pathways to providing them citizenship. But despite all of her promises, despite all of her fancy celebrity endorsements, it's not been all roses and rainbows for Kamala Harris. Because when Biden first stepped down and Kamala Harris was announced as the new candidate, she got a massive boost in the polls and actually overtook Trump. But since then, her lead has been steadily shrinking and she is now deadlocked with Trump going into election day. So let's look at the Trump campaign. Donald Trump's out here holding massive rallies, working at McDonald's, giving big speeches, surviving bloody assassinations, and somehow getting The Undertaker and Kane to back him for president. Right, everyone, November 5th, election mania. Choice is yours. You can go with President Trump, Kane, and The Undertaker, or you can take Kamala Harris, Faith Batista, and Tim Walls. Choose wisely. The nation depends on it. And that should be an easy choice. He's talking about rebuilding what he calls the greatest economy in history, which, according to him, translates to lower taxes, bigger paychecks for Americans, and more jobs. He also wants to secure borders and reclaim national sovereignty. He wants to declare war on the drug cartels, stop crime in cities and restore safety, reject globalism and embrace patriotism, provide better care for American veterans, drain the swamp of Washington corruption, better healthcare choices at lower costs, free, honest, and lawful elections, 
ending censorship and reclaiming free speech. And remember, Donald Trump has already served once as the president of the USA. And interestingly, just like Kamala has disproportionate support among women, Trump seems to have disproportionate support among men. And so as mentioned, elections are absolutely deadlocked. So who knows what's gonna happen on election day. But let's talk about something that we can actually know a little bit about by taking some educated guesses, which is what will be the impact of Trump or Kamala on India. Believe it or not, the results on India could be drastically different based on who actually gets elected. So if you look at Kamala Harris, for example, you'd think that Auntie Kamala, with her 50% Indian roots, something that she mentions over and over again. I stand before you as the first candidate for vice president of the United States of South Asian descent. You see a lot when you're the firstborn. I saw my mother and how she worked hard and she was full of pride and would never want anyone to ever pity her. She never complained about anything. You'd think that somebody with such a strong connection to India would actually be very good for India. Now, as they say, talk is cheap, cocaine isn't. Point is, when it comes to policy, sentiment only goes so far. Now, there's obviously some strategic issues on which India and America converge, like the US is looking to curb China's rise. And so India becomes a very good strategic partner for America in order to achieve that goal. The enemy of my enemy kind of a deal. Harris, much like Biden, has been very vocal about pushing back against Chinese aggression. She's attended summits where she's accused China of bullying its neighbors in the South China Sea and even backed Taiwan's right to self-defense. Harris has also pledged to continue support of Taiwan's self-defense. And since joining the Biden administration, she has not made many direct comments on Chinese human rights concerns, but as a senator, Harris co-sponsored legislation condemning China's treatment of both Hong Kong and the Uyghur minority group. We know that Beijing continues to coerce, to intimidate, and to make claims to the vast majority of the South China Sea. And raise the Foundation to abide by the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and to challenge its bullying and excessive maritime claims. And when China attacked India, Biden and Harris, to their credit, supported India. Biden began by pledging big support for India in its border standoffs, a clear reference to China. I said if the United States and India became closer friends and partners, then the world will be a safer place. <clears throat> if elected president, I'll continue to believe it and continue what I've long called for, including standing with India and confronting the threats it faces in its own region and along its borders. Biden even bagged Indians facing Trump's H-1B visa crackdown and those facing hate crimes. But like I said, it's not all roses and rainbows. In fact, quite the contrary. Kamala Harris has not shied away in the past from undermining India's national interests. And many analysts in America believe that if Kamala Harris does get elected as the president of the United States, that she will mostly toe the line of the American deep state. So before we move ahead, let's understand what the American deep state is. So the deep state in the United States refers to an alleged clandestine networks of government officials, particularly within agencies like the FBI and the CIA, as well as big business leaders and politicians who are believed to work alongside financial and industrial leaders to influence national policy outside of elected government structures. So the belief among many analysts is that no matter who's in charge, no matter who gets elected, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, this so-called deep state is what influences American national policy. So the belief of the U.S. deep state is if you do not align with U.S. interests, hook, line and sinker, they will destroy you. For example, as they did in Iran. Before 1953, Iranian Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh was an ally of the UK and the US. But when he decided to nationalize Iranian oil, it would hurt British oil interests, which hurt UK and US businesses and America's God-given right to cheap oil. And so in 1953, the friend became an enemy and the Americans helped overthrow Mossadegh's government. Let's look at Iraq in 2003, a more recent example, where before 2003, Saddam Hussein and America were actually quite close. And America used to talk about Saddam Hussein as an ally of America in the Middle East. However, when Saddam Hussein started taking actions that would benefit his country and his people over the American government, well, things changed. America invaded Iraq under the pretext of Saddam Hussein developing weapons of mass destruction and forcibly overthrew the Saddam Hussein government despite absolutely zero evidence of Iraq possessing any WMDs. America also claimed that Iraq was behind 9-11 attacks despite there being zero evidence.
evidence of this claim as well. In fact, the two countries that had the biggest involvement in 9-11 were Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, which were American allies. So instead, America bulldozed the concerns of the UN and the Global South and invaded Iraq, resulting in more than a million Iraqis dead and thousands of dead and injured American soldiers, which ultimately resulted in the rise of ISIS and Iran becoming the foremost power in the Middle East, directly undermining American interests. If you look at Afghanistan, after the 9-11 attacks, the US launched its war in Afghanistan, aiming to dismantle the Taliban regime, which they had, remember, created in the first place, while also continued to ignore the real culprit, Pakistan, which helped create the Taliban and was also home to the world's most wanted terrorists, including Osama bin Laden. This war stretched for over two decades, causing widespread destruction, hundreds of thousands of dead Afghans, and thousands of dead and injured American soldiers. And at the end of the day, America had to exit Afghanistan ignominiously, handing power right back to the Taliban, whom they ironically vowed to wipe out 20 years ago. So we've now seen what the US deep state does to other countries who do not fall in line with American interests. Now, India has not fallen in line with American interests completely because India has continued her relationship with Russia and despite the Americans threatening countries who continue to have relationships with Russia. And so the Biden administration, most likely under the administration of the deep state, started making the same moves that they make in countries where they want to bend the government to their will. Take Article 370, for example. Back in 2019, Indian Prime Minister Modi abrogated Article 370, which was a major step in ensuring the integration of Jammu and Kashmir with India. And Kamala Harris was quick to remind the world that the Kashmiris are not alone. Yeah, I know, there's a billion people in India. It's kind of tough to be alone. The US has also been criticized for funding NGOs and media outlets that undermine India's national interest, which also aims to weaken public support for India's leadership. Many of these organizations were involved in opposition to the obligation of Article 370, supporting the farmers' protests, opposing the Citizenship Amendment Act, as well as opposing the Uniform Civil Code. In 2022, the Indian government cancelled 6,000 NGOs permits who were receiving foreign funding to operate in India. The American government also funds various democracy indices which keep rating India as a non-free or a partly free democracy. The government-funded United States Commission on International Religious Freedom releases reports every year bemoaning the lack of religious freedom in India despite the fact that a non-Christian has never been elected the President of the United States while India has already had a non-Hindu Prime Minister and a Muslim President. The US routine holds the leader of opposition Rahul Gandhi where he openly asks for foreign intervention in India. So the surprising thing is that the, the so-called defenders of democracy which are the United States, uh, European countries seem to just be oblivious that a huge chunk of the democratic model has come undone right? which is a real problem with regards to uh, and, and frankly we are the opposition is fighting that battle right and it's not just an Indian battle. It's actually a much more important battle because- Please understand here, clearly what, what he was trying to imply is that since it is a global good, let them come in and intervene and preserve this global good. Isn't this what uh, colonial powers were trying to do? Where he meets with organizations that have alleged links with people like George Soros, who have promised to overthrow the democratically elected Indian government, as well as the Pakistani ISI, which, as you may be aware, is a funder of global terrorist organizations. There are other ways in which the American deep state tries to undermine Indian national interests. For example, in April this year, Bangladeshi Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina accused the Americans of trying to topple her government, and a couple of months after after that, exactly that happened and an American puppet named Muhammad Yunus was installed as Prime Minister after ousting Sheikh Hasina. In fact, documents obtained by the Sunday Guardian revealed a US-backed initiative called Promoting Accountability, Inclusivity and Resiliency Support Program, or PEARS, which began in early 2019 and was implemented by the International Republican Institute. It was funded through grants from the National Endowment for Democracy, NED, and USAID. A key objective of the PEARS program was reportedly to counter balance India's perceived influence in Bangladesh. The initiative aimed to address India's support for the Awami League, which is Sheikh Hasina's party, and reduce Indian closeness with Bangladesh in order to isolate India. The Americans also allegedly played a key role in providing so-called intelligence to Canada regarding the killing of Khalistani terrorist Hardeep Singh Nidja. The Americans offered key context that helped Canada suspect Indian involvement, and this so-called intelligence that has still not been shared publicly with India was shared 
shared through the Five Eyes Network, a network between the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. Remember, pretty much all of this happened during the Biden-Harris tenure, which was operated by the US deep state to keep India weakened because the US deep state sees any other powerful country as a threat to its global hegemony. Another issue that Kamala Harris might face is the charge of dual loyalty because Kamala Harris is half Indian. She will face a lot of scrutiny from some people in her country because of that heritage. So if she's ever seen to be pro-India, her opponents will attack her and question whether she is loyal to India or to America, which is why I suspect that Kamala Harris, in order to prove her loyalty to America, will be even more anti-India than previous presidents. Let's now talk about what could happen if Trump comes to power. Trump already served as president between 2017 and 2021, but he always showed a positive outlook towards India and Indians. I am a big fan of Hindu and I am a big fan of India. Well, I have great respect for Hindus. I have so many friends that are Hindu and they are great people, amazing entrepreneurs. A lot of people don't understand they are amazing entrepreneurs. The Indian and Hindu community will have a true friend in the White House that I can guarantee you that I can tell you. Trump showed in his first term that unlike Biden and Harris, he would not be bullied by the deep state because he had genuine support from his voter base and he had the personality and power of will to go against the diktats of the deep state and follow his own vision. He was driven less by American hegemonic political interests and more by business and economic interests. Trump's tenure was a genuine positive for India because Trump essentially is a businessman and hence very transactional. If you work with him, he is willing to work with you and he will give you enough leeway to be able to work on your own terms, which is contrary to how the US deep state operates. India signed the COMCASA with the Trump administration, which is the Communications Compatibility and Security Arrangement. India and the US inked a long negotiated pact under which critical and encrypted defense technologies will be provided to the Indian military by the Americans. The Communications Compatibility Security the agreement or COMCASA was signed after the first two plus two talks. It lets the US share encrypted communications with India's military. This enhances India's ability to use advanced US made defense systems and enables better interoperability during joint operations and military exercises. It provided Sea Guardian drones to India. It provided software and systems which improved real time intelligence sharing and helped integrate India's military systems with US platforms. And ultimately, it was a good transaction for India because India got cutting edge technology and it was a good transaction for Trump because the American government got a big payday. Another big agreement between the US and India in 2020 was the Basic Exchange and Cooperation Agreement, which facilitates the exchange of geospatial intelligence and advanced satellite data, which is crucial for improving accuracy in missile systems and armed drones. This agreement strengthened India's strategic capabilities, particularly in mapping out military operations and improving missile targeting and enabling better maritime awareness. And in return, the Americans got a good payday. Again, these were the kind of agreements which India and the US shared during Trump Trump's tenure, which not only helped us, but also helped Trump get a good deal for his country. And again, because India was willing to do business with Trump, he backed India's national interest. Donald Trump strongly supported India on the global stage after the 2019 Pulwama attack in Jammu and Kashmir. He also tacitly supported the abrogation of Article 370 by India, saying that that was India's internal matter, unlike the Democrats who made all kinds of nonsense human rights statements. He also said that he will stop paying Pakistan the aid money in the same interview. That's right. No, it's a terrible thing going on right now between Pakistan and India is a very, very bad situation and it's a very dangerous situation between the two countries. No, I stopped paying Paying Pakistan the 1.3 billion dollars that we were paying them. In 2020, when the Indian government banned TikTok and other Chinese apps, this action of India was also supported by the American President Trump, and he himself said that he was in favor of banning these Chinese apps because it is a matter of country's crucial data. And so India recognized Trump's transactional nature and thus was able to create a good working relationship, which brought the US and India very close during that time. Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra. Today, India welcomes us at the world's largest cricket stadium right here. India has an important leadership role to play in shaping a better future 
as you take on greater responsibility for solving problems and promoting peace throughout this incredible region. And look, it wasn't all perfect. Some of his actions also affected India negatively. In 2018, Trump imposed heavy tariffs on steel and aluminium imports from around the world, including India. India used to get special trade benefits under a program called the GSP, that certain products the U.S. without any tariffs. In 2019, Trump ended this, cutting off a benefit that helped $6 billion worth of Indian exports. There were also clashes over India's export of generic drugs to the U.S. Trump's administration felt that India wasn't giving enough access to American medical devices and other industries in return. But then ultimately, what you need to remember is that Trump always showed a willingness to work with India because India was willing to work with Trump and willing to do business with Trump on their own terms. And Trump isn't interested in dirty geopolitics. He is only interested in business and what's the best deal for the US. So he was happy to work with India. And so even when it comes to India's relationship with Russia, which is a very important geopolitical relationship for India, there might be two very different reactions, whether it's Kamala in office or Trump in office. Harris, it is expected, is going to take the US deep state line. We don't want to work with Russia, and so you shouldn't either. She'll push India to distance itself from Russia because of the whole Ukraine invasion situation. She's already talked tough on Russia and will definitely pressure India about its energy ties with Moscow. President Zelensky, I look forward to our discussion today, and I will continue to work with you to ensure Ukraine prevails in this conflict and remains a free, democratic, an independent nation. And if you don't do that, then the underhanded destabilization of India will continue through NGOs, government-funded democracy indices, religious freedom reports, providing tacit support to dangerous politicians like Rahul Gandhi. But under Trump, it could be a slightly different story. Trump even said that he would stop sending them aid tomorrow if he was in charge. On behalf of the very same country, Ukraine, that apparently paid his family all of these millions of dollars. In light of this information, the U.S. Congress should refuse to authorize a single additional payment. Trump has also showed a bizarre admiration for Putin at certain times. He's already claimed that he can end the Russia-Ukraine war in one day. So as long as India is willing to work with Trump, Trump might not care that much about India's relationship with Russia. Also, his fierce anti-China stance could actually bring the U.S. and India closer. Jesus Christ! Yeah. Jesus Christ! Yeah. Christ is king! Christ is Trump doesn't like China at all. And for India, dealing with China, is, it's like when you have a terrible neighbor in your backyard, like Pakistan. So Trump could be potentially beneficial for India-America relationship. In the meantime, India has also sent a very big message to China during BRICS by signing a pretty significant agreement with China in which China has agreed with India to go back to the 2020 borders before the Galwan clash, where China claimed to have gained some land within India. This is a very major development because it is the first time in Chinese history that they have agreed to give back land that they claim to have taken. So it is obviously a very big diplomatic win for India as well and it is also believed that Russia was behind getting India and China to come together and come to an agreement. So India has given a message to America that by being antagonistic towards India, you're simply forcing India, China and Russia together and ultimately making Russia and China together. And so that's what I think might happen if whether Kamala comes to office or Trump comes to office. I think because of Trump's transactional nature, he might actually be better for India because Modi knows Trump, Modi knows Trump's transactional nature and Modi knows how to work with Trump and how to develop a good working relationship with Trump. But I want to ask you, what do you think will happen? Do you think Kamala Harris getting elected will be better for India or Trump getting elected will be better for India. Let me know your thoughts and comments in the comment section down below. Other than that, if you haven't subscribed to our Patreon or to our YouTube membership yet, please do so. And I will see you for the next episode. Until then, stay happy, stay healthy. I will see you for the next one. And to all of you, a secular pranam.